Close your eyes and imagine. What if the things in life that cause us the greatest pain, the things that bring us grief, are challenges? Challenges designed to help us grow to ultimately become what we were always meant to be. We feel like we've been buried, but what if, like a seed, we've been planted? And having been planted, we grow to become a mighty tree. Now, open your eyes. Open your eyes to this way of viewing life. Come with me as we explore your true, infinite, eternal nature. This is Grief to Growth, and I am your host, Brian Smith. Hey, everybody. I want to do a real quick introduction to this episode with Lionel Friedman. Lionel has lived a long and adventurous life, so we do talk quite a bit about the details of his life in the beginning of the episode, and toward the end, we get more into general topics. So I do encourage you to stick around for the entire episode. It's it's really good. It's all fascinating. Uh, he's lived an, an amazing life. The book is incredible. If you like movies, if you like adventures, then I do recommend you get the book. But uh, I'll stick around for the interview. And as I said, if you can, stay till the end. Have a great one. Hey, everybody. This is Brian. I'm back with another episode of Grief to Growth. And today I've got with me Lionel Friedberg. Uh, Lionel has written a fascinating book about, about his life. And we're going to discuss his book today. Uh, I'm going to read his bio, and then we're going to go ahead and conver- have a conversation. Um, Lionel is an award-winning um an Emmy award-winning producer and New York Times bestselling author. He spent 50 years making films as diverse as full-length the- theatrical features and television documentaries. And he grew up in South Africa during the, during the apartheid era. era. And he be- be- began his career during the dying days of colonialism in Central Africa. Now, Lionel eventually settled in, in Los Angeles, where his work took him to the sound stages of Hollywood and to the rem- most remote regions of the earth. And his career exposed him to extraordinary wonders of our planet. They brought him into close contact with many unforgettable personalities, which he outlines in his books. From maverick scientists to politicians, entertainers, and to people who survived near-death experiences. Now, the reason I wanted to talk to Lionel today is his observations have taught him that life is far more complex and and infinitely stranger than we can imagine. He was struck by an unexpected life-threatening illness. And in his efforts to find a way to save his life, they took him back to Africa, where he encountered the age-old rituals and powerful healing methods of a lot of, of African shamans. And their mysterious ways have much to teach us, Lionel believes, and are as relevant today as they were in ancient times. So with that, I want to welcome Lionel Friedberg. And Lionel, I should have asked you before we started, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yeah, you got it spot on. Lionel Friedberg is exactly right. Thank you. <laughs> Lionel, I really, um, it's great to have you here today, and I'm really looking forward to your interview, and I was telling you before I got started, there's so much in your book and so much about your life. I'm not sure how much we can get through, but we'll we'll do our best. So um, if you could just briefly tell me, you know, like you were, you were uh, raised in South Africa, and tell me about, you know, a little bit about your background. Yeah, uh, I, I, I regard myself as, and I, I don't mean to sound boastful or arrogant about this in any way at all, but I think I've been extraordinarily fortunate. I've been blessed with an amazingly fascinating life. And um, it began, you know, I was an only child uh, living in South Africa. Um, I was born in the, uh, just after the, the, after the Second World War. I'm now 76 years old. And so I grew up there, went to school there. Mm-hmm. And grew up in the midst of that apartheid system, that 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 divisive, iniquitous system, that was really very difficult. Even as a child, it was it was obvious to me that there was something grossly wrong with the way we were living our lives. We were mm-hmm. privileged white society, and we all had black servants in our homes. Um, and the twain never met between white and black society, and it was very clear to me that this wasn't right. Uh, we, we all had servants in our homes and you know I had a nanny as well. And why I say that is because very, very early on in my, in my childhood, I must have been about five or six years old, my, I had a wonderful nanny. Um, and one day she, she had a day off 
Mm-hmm. And because I was an only child, she said to me, I'm going to see a friend this afternoon. You want to come with me? So I said, sure, absolutely. And um, so we went down the road in this little town where we were living, a place called Kempton Park, which is to the east of Johannesburg. It's where the big international airport is now, Oliver Tembo International Airport, named after uh, one of the heroes of the of the struggle mm-hmm. in the in the apartheid system. And um and we went down down the road to see uh, to see her friend who was also a, a black woman working in a white household and these people had tiny little facilities uh, in the in the backyards of these of these houses a little tiny minuscule room a little cold shower and a toilet and that was it that were, all of these people had uh, our, our servant had that and so did this this other woman that we were going to visit her friend um you know, and I was, I was, she always used to sing lullabies to me. And, you know, she used to tell me stories, uh, um, basically based on, on tribal lore. And I found that all very fascinating. And I loved this woman. And she said, come and visit my friend. So, of course, I was very keen to do that. And we went down the road. And when we got to this little room at the back of this yard where her, her friend lived, there were like maybe two or three other people standing outside the door waiting to see her. And, you know, so my nanny said to me, oh, you know, she's obviously, she's seeing, she's seeing some people. So I said, uh, why can't we go in? And she said, no, 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 no. She's, 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 she's being, she's being a doctor. She's, she's being a doctor. You know, what did I understand at six years of age? Um, this is a woman who polished the floors, cleaned the, you know, cleaned in the kitchen, cooked the food. How can she be a doctor? Mm-hmm. And she says, yeah, she's being a doctor. So I thought, what do you mean? And she said, well, when we go inside her room, she'll show you. And sure enough, when after these two people had been inside the room and came out little, carrying little satchels, something inside it, I didn't know what they were, we went in there. And in this little room, which was very spartan, there was a bed, of course, and a little, a little stove where she could cook her food, a little primer stove, you know, used paraffin. Mm-hmm. Um, it had one electric, naked electric light bulb in the roof. Um, and often these lights didn't even work. I mean, these people often used candles. It was it was it was an unbelievable period of time. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, on in her room were all these shelves, and on these shelves were little containers, little bottles and jars and stuff. And there was all sorts of strange things inside there that I did not recognize. Obviously, herbs, sands, you know, grains of stuff, little uh, feathers, a couple of animal skins and whatever else. And I, I was intrigued by all of this. So my nanny said to her, tell him what you do here, you know, when you're not working inside, when you, when you have your day off, what do you do here? T- tell, tell him. And so she explained to me, she said, well, I have learned in my tribe when I grew up there how to become a sangoma. It's the first time I ever heard the word Sangoma. Mm -hmm. Sangoma is the word, it's a Zulu word originally, but it's now used by all the tribes. By the way, there are 11 languages and different tribal groups in South Africa, but they all, all the shamans go by the name of Sangoma. That's the Mm. sort of, you know, um, uh, generic name for, for these folks. And she explained to me that what she did was she could help heal people. And the way she did that was to, read the bones and I said what do you mean read the bones Mm -hmm. and she had a little grass mat in the middle of her room on on this concrete floor and on this grass mat was a little animal skin bag and she took it and she shook it like this and there was a clinking sound inside and she said inside here are my bones and I said show me and she said sure and she turned the bag upside down and what fell out were a bunch of various bones a few stones pebbles and other trinkets in there Mm. These were the tools, the medium by which she could speak to her ancestors. Now, one thing we have to uh, realize about the healing paradigm in the African tradition is very much centered on contact with the ancestors, Mm. the ancestral spirits. The ancestors are the ones who will guide, teach, diagnose, prognose, um, see into the future, and also do all sorts of other amazing things with with the sangoma so the so sangoma looks at the bones and they come from various animals some of them have to come from certain animals like a goat a hyena a lion mm. uh, a, a crocodile even there's a little, little even a crocodile tooth in the and and it, the, all of these sets of bones of all the shamans all the sangomas that i've ever met they all have these specific objects but then they can all add their own little individual bits and pieces to it as and when they feel fit whatever speaks to them 
or it allows them to contact their ancestral spirits is what they use in these bones. And the way the bones fall on this little grass mat apparently is, is influenced by the ancestors. Mm. And so the way these bones fall, upside down, left to right, whatever else, one on top of the other, means something very specific. And these people can read that. So mm. she was trying to explain all this to me. I mean, I was lost. It sounded like, like a high adventure to me. It was fantastic, <laughs> you know. And I thought, wow, you know. Now, the whites, of course, went, called these people. I knew that they existed. They would call them witch doctors, which was right. a derogatory term. Right. And totally incorrect, because there's ain't nothing to do with witches about this. But, you know, they were all went by the term of witch doctor. Mm -hmm. But the, really, they were Sangomas. They were herbalists. They were diviners. They were clairvoyants. They could do all kinds of things. And the other thing that they did, and they did it remarkably well, because I've even had experience of this myself, which we can get to in a moment. Mm -hmm. And that is that they knew, know how to go into the natural world and pick um, leaves and, uh, 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 you know, herbs and uh, whatever else from the environment in order to make medications to help mm -hmm. people heal. And um, so that's what all these little bottles and jars and powders were for. And that's what these people obviously were carrying out when I was waiting outside her room. Mm -hmm. And so I found all this really intriguing. Anyway, you know, my friends spent a little time. They were yakking away in a language that I didn't understand. None of us white kids were taught any black languages at all. We learned two languages. We learned English and Afrikaans. And everyone had to learn those two languages, including all the black folk. But mm -hmm. did we learn any black languages? No, absolutely not. Not back in those days, not right. during the apartheid era. Things right. are different now. It's, mm -hmm. it's all a very different country today. Mm -hmm. But anyway, you know, so I, I, I paint that picture because that was my first introduction into the healing paradigm of Africa, which I now have had extensive experience of. And it has been an extraordinary journey for me. I think that I have learned more from those folks than I have from anyone else. And believe me, I don't want to sound boastful again. I've made movies with a ton of different people all over the world, yeah, yeah. from universities to, you, you know, you name it. I've worked with NASA. I've been, you know, to all sorts of exciting places. But I've learned more from some of the people who live in mud huts in the middle of nowhere, who don't even speak English, mm -hmm. about how one can develop a relationship with the natural world, how you can tune into the a higher realm of, 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 of thinking, mm -hmm. raising one's consciousness and learning a lot about life and healing yourself through folks like that. It has been amazing. Now, let me just jump forward ahead a little bit. Mm -hmm. Comes the year 1960. I finished my education. I'm done with school. High school is done. Everything is finished. My father, who was originally an immigrant from Latvia, he married a South African woman and I was mm -hmm. their only child. My father decided to leave the country because apartheid was really very, very, uh, he found it a, a, an immoral system, could not live with it. And, you know, he'd seen life elsewhere in the world. He was originally from Europe. Mm -hmm. And he said to my mother, you know, I think it's time we, we get out of here. This is just not, not the way. I don't, we, we shouldn't bring up a kid in a situation like this. Um, and so he took a job at a store. Now, by trade, he was a watchmaker, which he learned in Europe, in Latvia. Mm -hmm. You know, tinkering in the days when watches had little coiled springs and little me mechanical parts, you know. Those, yeah. <laughs> you remember those? Yeah. I, I, I have a watch like that because in tribute to my dad. Mm -hmm. I don't wear an electronic watch. you got to either wind it up, you know, or, or, I, or I don't use a watch. Anyway, so that's what my dad did. And he took a job at a small store where he could be a watchmaker um, in what was then known as, I'm sorry about the fire brigade in the background, but anyway, um, uh, in, in an area that was known as Northern Rhodesia. Now, Northern Rhodesia was basically two countries north of where we were. Okay. The country directly above us was north of South Africa was at that time called Southern Rhodesia, mm -hmm. named after Cecil Rhodes, one of the great British uh, empire builders, you know, land grabbers yeah, <laughs> in yeah. the world. Although his legacy did uh, spawn the Rhodes Scholarships, you know, you have to give the guy oh, credit, okay. credit. I did not know that. that. Yeah. yeah, the Rhodes Scholarship is named after him because the guy made a fortune out of gold and diamonds, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so Southern Rhodesia was, was one territory. It was British, a British colony. And to the north of that was Northern Rhodesia. 
And that's where my dad got this job in this little tiny mining town where they mined copper. Copper had a, was, 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 you know, a very big commodity those days and, you know, fetched a big price. It's not so much today, but those days copper was a, was a really important commodity used in all kinds of stuff, particularly after the war. They used it in all sorts of, you know, machines and war machines and whatever else. So it was a very, very wealthy area way up in the northern part of northern Rhodesia, right on the border of the Belgian Congo. Today, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. But those days, it was still the Belgian Congo. And that was the year that Belgium gave Congo its independence. And it was the beginning of a war that has never ended ever since that, that event happened. Um, the, the, you know, there was complete chaos after the Belgians just, you know, threw uh, the Congo away without having really prepared anybody for independence. And of course, there was a lot of they, uh, the Congo became a pawn in the Cold War because the, the, the Congo mm-hmm. was was and still is to this day extremely rich in raw materials. Right. You know, the uranium that was used in the bombs that were dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima actually came from the Congo. Mm-hmm. I don't know if folks know that. I mean, that's the Congo has every kind of natural uh, uh, wealth that you, mm-hmm. you, 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 can, you can imagine comes out of the ground in the Congo. So it became a pawn between East and West. And both sides were playing against one another within the Congo. And this inflamed this war that began in the Congo. And it was at that time that my dad decides to go north to live in the country directly on the border of this country that's in chaos. But it was okay because Northern Rhodesia was peaceful and quiet because it was a British territory. And so he went up there and I have to just say this to, to, to your viewers um, because it's, it's an important commodity in my story. Mm-hmm. I always love the movies. I praise and thank my mom to the end of my days for having dragged me to every film that she ever went to see ever since I was like four years old, because I love the movies. And so my passion right from the get go was I wanted to eventually get to Hollywood and make Hollywood movies uh, as a kid. Yeah. So w- when I was 11, a cousin of mine gave me an old used movie camera. Now these were long before the days of video, of course, we're using, we're talking about film now, right. you know, eight millimeter film. So he gave me that. And as a kid, you know, from 11 years old onwards, I was making films for my school, sporting events, birthday parties, stuff like that, you know. And I even made an epic called The Glory of the Garden because my mother was an avid gardener. Wow. <laughs> and, I, and I used, you know, Hollywood music in the movie and all, all kinds of stuff. So I love the movies. And what I really wanted to do, some of my favorite films of those days were all the Tarzan movies, the adventure films, the African Queen, King Solomon's Mines, all mm-hmm. those wonderful stories about Africa, mm-hmm. you know, um, because Africa is a place of unbelievable adventure, you know, the horizons are endless. Yeah. There is so much, especially those days where that were not known about the continent. It was a place of mystery, mystique, and, you know, adventure yeah. and I thought, wow so my folks are going to live in an area like that i'm going to take my camera i ain't going to go to university which my parents said that's what you should do go and get a life and i said no i'm coming with you i'm going up to northern Rhodesia with you guys because i want to make movies up there mm-hmm. i mean not having a clue how i was going to do that but that was my <laughs> ambition so anyway when i when we got up there i was i was horrified because all there was was a copper mine and a town yeah. Okay. And the bush from horizon to horizon was just, you know, thick bush and nothing else. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I thought, what have I done? You know, what am I going to do here? Mm-hmm. And there were a string of these little copper mines and there was a local newspaper. And after a couple of months, I looked in the newspaper one day and there was a little tiny ad in the newspaper, which announced we're looking for staff for a new television station that was being built in one of these towns. For me, it was like heaven had heard my prayers. I thought, oh my, I got to get a job at this place. And I went and had an interview. Of course, they weren't looking for, you know, super uh, um, technicians and producers. All those folks were being brought in from Europe and from the UK. But they were looking for local people like drivers and people to work with menial jobs in the station. 
Right. And, and I said, I will pay you guys. I don't care what job it is, but I got to work here. So they gave me a job and I, I, I started working before they even went on the air. I helped them, you know, piece the whole place together, put it all together. Mm -hmm. And here was this tiny station, which eventually went on the air. I can never forget the date because it was like the beginning of my life. The 15th of December, 1961, mm -hmm. we went on the air and it was an amazing experience for me because for the next three years, what we did was this. In the mornings, we would do educational broadcasts for local vernacular uh, mm -hmm. speaking people, local tribes in the vernacular languages. The main language in Zambia uh, in that part of the country is Bemba. And in the afternoons, we would do uh, a, what they would call cultural programming for, for adults, people who are living in the bush, you know, mm -hmm. for, for the various tribal tri um, communities. So we would have these groups of people arriving in the afternoon in their tribal regalia and drums and skirts and musical instruments, and they would dance and play music. And it was like being in another world. It was amazing. Yeah. And, then, and then at night, we'd have Leave it to Beaver and Bonanza <laughs> and everything that you guys were seeing here in the States. So I was living in this dual world. Yeah. And it was incredible. Yeah. Anyway, to cut a long story short, when Northern Rhodesia was given its independence by Britain, which was happening at that time, Britain was mm -hmm. giving up all its colonies. It was the end of the colonial period. Mm -hmm. And I discussed that whole episode uh, in some detail in my book as to you know what that really meant and how it was. Mm -hmm. um, but one day, I was, all, this, all the staff at the station, of course, were, needless to say, were white. But one day, um, after we had become independent, the country became independent and became the Republic of Zambia under a black government, mm -hmm. We guys at the station all got a pink slip to say that the station has been nationalized yeah. by, by the government. And you have all done a wonderful job. Thank you very much. But in six months time, bye bye. Out of here. Your jobs are going to be taken over by local people. None of us argued with that idea because it made perfect sense. The country was now independent. It had a right to run itself and it had it. it we fully understood why they wanted to staff this place with local black people zambians mm -hmm. but the big problem was what was I, what was i going to do with my life you know where would i go now the others could go back to europe and wherever else they came from you know right. but what was i going to do my dream was to get to hollywood now how do you do that when you're living in the middle of africa and you know you haven't really got a background how is how, what am i going to do with my with, with with my life and um so we had um a guy working for us a, a wonderful black guy who wasn't much older than me. His name was David Firi. Uh, he was also a member of the Bemba ethnic group. And the next morning, I, I, after I, and I got back from the station late that night with this little slip telling me, thanks very much, but you know, you got to leave in six months. Right. So the next morning I said to him, and he and I were really good buddies. He loved photography. We gave him a camera for Christmas one year. And, you know, we used to, he used to spend his time talking to me about photography all the time. Eventually he wanted to open his own photographic studio. So he and I had a lot in common. And the next day I said, David, you know, I don't know what to do because I've been fired. I've been basically told to leave the station. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no. He said, why? And I said, well, because my job's going to be taken over by one of you guys. And what, but what am I going to do with my life? And he said, oh, and he thought about this. And he said, you want to go back to South Africa? I did not want to go back to South Africa. Mm -hmm. Even though there was a thriving film industry in South Africa, mm -hmm. I didn't want to go back to that whole apartheid and this, we're talking about 1964, 65 now. I didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, I don't know what to do. And he said, well, I will try and find someone who may be able to help you. I said, like what? You know, like who? Mm -hmm. Who's, who's going to tell me what to do? You know? And he said, just stick around. I'll, I'll find someone. And the next day he came back and he said, okay, on Thursday or whatever day it was, we're going to drive into the bush and I'm going to introduce you to somebody. And that person will tell you about your future. And I, I gave, I, I trusted the guy implicitly. I said, okay, whatever you say, David, mm -hmm. whatever you say, I'll do exactly what you say. So, so the day came and there we were going along in my little secondhand VW Beetle, driving along this dirt road on the outskirts of a town called Ndola to this little settlement, a little sort of tribal settlement about 
maybe a few miles in the bush. And on the edge of the settlement was one single house, little tiny house, all on its own. And David said, I think that's the place there. Let's go there. So we went there and he knocked on the door. And this little old lady came to the door. It was a hot day, as it always is in that part of the world. But she was all covered up. She had a, like a trench coat on and a, and a, and a, 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 you know, a, a rug around her shoulders. And she, she was like half blind. She was old, wrinkled and old and very, very short. One of the things about her that, that, that struck me, first of all, is that she was an albino. You know, sometimes there's a skin pigment problem and the skin doesn't go entirely black and it's kind of more white than black. Sometimes people like that are regarded as freaks and are sort of, you know, not liked by the tribe, but she was right. highly respected because they said that she had special powers. She was chosen because mm. of her power. And that was the sign of her powers. Well, we went inside her little house and she brought us into this little room. And the minute I walked into that room, there was some kind of resonance about my childhood because the smells and the things that I saw in that room reminded me of my childhood the day I went into my nanny's friend's room in that town way, right. way back because there was a grass mat on the floor. There mm -hmm. was a little bag sitting on that grass mat and there were shelves with little bottles and containers of all sorts of weird things that I didn't recognize mm -hmm. on the shelf. So I knew, ah, she does what that woman did mm -hmm. way, way back. This is going to be very interesting. So a long, kind of long story short, she spoke no English, but thank goodness for David, he translated everything for me. She made us sit down. She said, blow into the bag, which I did, and say your name, which I did. And then she took some snuff, which is ground up tobacco powder, you know, uh, tobacco yeah. leaves. And she put it in there. That's an offering to the spirits. She shook the bag like this, and then she turned it upside down, and all of these bones and stones and little things fell on the grass mat and she leaned over it like this and she looked and suddenly she went like this oh she said i can't see anything it's too bright you know i can shock and i thought oh my god you know what's happened mm -hmm. and she says to david she said why why have why are all these bright lights shining at me what what am i looking at she didn't understand what she was seeing but she was seeing lights obviously now i'm telling you this woman was half blind her eyes was like you know ancient and yet you could see that she was struggling to see um mm. because of some kind of whatever it was that she was seeing in the bones and david said she wants to know what these big bright lights are that that she's seeing and it struck me oh my god she's seeing the lights in the studio where i worked yeah, yeah. and the minute i heard that i thought this woman is for real you better pay attention to what she has to tell you. And she, for the next hour or so, she just sat there picking at these bones and she didn't stop speaking for a second. It just kept flowing out of her. And David was translating for me and I was trying my best to keep pace, making notes. He was trying to keep pace with her. She told me so many things and every single thing that this old woman told me that day, 60 years ago, all came true. There were moments, there were highlights in my life that actually blew, blew me away when they happened because I only recognized when they came to pass that she yeah. foretold all that stuff. Yeah. I, des I describe all this in the book. Yes. You know, um, I mean, I, I, let me give one example for your viewers. Um, sure. You know, like, for example, she says, he's not going to stay here. He is going to cross the big water. Now, she didn't know what she was seeing because Zambia, remember, is a landlocked country. Mm -hmm. This poor this little lady probably had never in her life had seen the ocean, you know. Maybe right. she'd seen the nearby river and had never been more than 10 miles away from her village. But she said he will cross the big ocean in that direction. And she's pointing to the north. And when he goes there, there will be more lights and there will be very famous people, and there he will do his work. Mm -hmm. now, I had no idea what any of this meant. Yes. Until I emigrated, I, I eventually left uh, Zambia, went back to South Africa, worked in the film industry, and I emigrated to Canada because the, you couldn't get a visa to come to the USA those days because of the anti-apartheid policies. They wouldn't give, us, uh, give South Af white South Africans visas in those days. It was mm -hmm. really difficult to immigrate. But I, I could go to Canada. And that, for me, was good enough because that was like my, you know, the road to Hollywood, if you like. And so 
those days you didn't travel by air, you went by sea. I'm talking about 1966. And so on the voyage going to Europe, on the ship one night, I was standing up on the deck all on my own. And I used to look back south every night because in the Southern Hemisphere is, a, is, 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 a, is the Southern Cross, um, which is, all, is as, almost as conspicuous in the sky like the Big Dipper is here in the Northern Hemisphere. It defines the Southern sky. And I would look at the Southern Cross every night getting lower and lower and lower and lower in, on the horizon mm. because we were moving north. Right. And halfway along this voyage, it took 13 days to get to, to, to Europe from South Africa. I suddenly realized she foresaw this. Yeah. I am crossing the big water and I am going north. That's what I'm doing. I'm sailing across the Atlantic and I'm going from one hemisphere of the planet to the other. That old woman had foreseen this. Mm. Another thing that she told, uh, she told me, she said lots of things, but you know, he has another example. She told David, she said, one day he will go to a world where there is only white there is no color in this world at all except white mm. and he will be there and uh, he will do work there and i thought <laughs> you know what's that mean <laughs> yeah well comes 1991 i'm on a scientific expedition making a film for pbs and i'm going to antarctica <clears throat> and now we're we're, we're we're doing some research work in the ice basically to 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 do some uh to find out is global warming really happening is the ozone hole getting bigger or getting smaller uh is the environment in the antarctic being uh, affected by co2 in the atmosphere and methane and is the sea getting more acidic all that kind of stuff so right. we're doing all this off an icebreaker research ship and it's 1991, it's Christmas Eve, the captain stops the ship, we're, we're dead still, the, the sea is covered in pack ice, and, you know, everybody's partying on board the ship, and I went up on the deck, it was cold, I was going to got all cuddled up, and writing in my diaries, I kept copious notes of everything in my life, mm. and I'm sitting, sitting up there on the deck, and it's like midnight, and it's not dark because it's the Southern Hemisphere and we're so far south that the sun never set, you know, mm. it, it, perpetual daylight. And I looked around me and I thought, wow, this is like being in a big translucent egg because the sea was white, the ice was everywhere, the sky was white. You couldn't even see where the horizon and the sky, uh, et, you know, met. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly realized, oh my God, this is what that woman had seen. I'm in a world where there is only white. There is no color here. And I'm doing work here. You know, I was, I was making a movie. She foresaw that on and on and on. There were so many incidents like that, mm -hmm. that this incredible old woman had foreseen in her bones in a, in a little hut in Central Africa all those years ago. And I know you know, when, this, when this event happened, it's like over, nearly three decades after she foresaw it. Yeah. You know, it was incredible. We'll get back to grief to growth in just a few seconds. Did you know that Brian is an author and a life coach? If you're grieving or know someone who is grieving, his book, Grief to Growth, is a best-selling, easy-to-read book that might help you or someone you know. People work with Brian as a life coach to break through barriers and live their best lives. You can find out more about Brian and what he offers at www.grieftogrowth.com www.grief, the number two, G-R-O-W-T-H dot com, or text GROWTH, G-R-O-W-T-H, to 31996. If you'd like to support this podcast, visit www.patreon.com slash grief to growth, www.patreon dot com slash G-R-I-E-F, the number two, G-R-O-W-T-H, to make a financial contribution. And now back to grief to growth. Yeah. You know, the, the thing is, is I was reading your book and, it, and you know, one of the things you said that you, when you were talking about, you said, I kept copious notes. Cause I was like, I wonder how you got so much detail on the book. Cause it, the book, we feel like, I felt like I was going on the adventures with you. Um, so you did a really good job of, of bringing us along and helping us to understand. And as you tell that story, I want to make sure that people understand that from the time that she gave you these predictions, until yeah. some of them came true was like 30 years or so, more or, or, or more yeah, yeah. No, even more i mean this this was like this was over 50 years ago nearly 60 years ago she told me all that time mm -hmm. and it's still happening even now 
like for, for like for example, one of the things she said was, one day he's going to get very very sick. Mm -hmm. The only way that he's going to find any healing is to go to the place where he came from. I didn't know what that meant. And it turns out that, you know, just a, a few years ago, I was uh, diagnosed with a serious kidney condition. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, uh, uh, in fact, this was 1996, I think it was. And, you know, my nephrologist said to me, I, I had a biopsy and he said, you know, your kidneys are failing. You're, you have an autoimmune disorder that is so serious, both of your kidneys are being attacked by your immune system and your kidneys are going to fail. You're either going to be on dialysis within 10 years or you're going to be dead, one of the two. And when I heard that, I thought, maybe this is what that woman had fore foretold because she told me I was going to get very, very sick. But here's the amazing thing. I have a friend who's a surgeon. He's a white guy like me, and he's the same age as me. And he studied at, uh, at, at, at Stanford University. He originally studied in Johannesburg, uh, and then he went to Stanford, and he became a, a, a general surgeon there. He practices now in Santa Barbara. And his big thing is studying the shamanic methods of back in South Africa, which is mm. where he came from. Mm -hmm. Because there's been so much, so much proof of healing that has taken place from those traditional healers, particularly the medicine that they dispense to people. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't come from big, you know, a uh, uh, major pharmaceutical, big pharma yeah. stuff that they pick from trees and leaves and grass in the bush mm -hmm. and people get healed. So my this friend of mine, uh, the surgeon, he wanted to study their methods and become, if you like, even ordained in the capability of being able to do that. So what he did was he found himself a teacher back in Africa to do that. And this guy was living in Swaziland, which is a neighborhood, a neighboring country in South Africa. It sits between South Africa and Mozambique. And he had a teacher there who was teaching him the ways of, of the shaman, of the Sangoma. And how they were, you know, find how you, how you go into the boondocks and find healing stuff from herbs and ebes and whatever else. And, 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 and remember, he's a general surgeon. And when, when I told him about my kidney illness, he said, he said, you know, I'm going back to South Africa and I'm going to, back to my teacher to, to, for about six weeks to learn to have another course. He used to go back once a year. Mm -hmm. And he said, why don't you come with me? I said, what for? And he said, uh, because maybe those guys, maybe my teacher or maybe he knows someone like him who will be able to help you. And I said, excuse me, you are a surgeon mm. and you telling me I I've got some of the best uh, uh, um, uh, specialists in the world looking after me here in L.A. Right. You're telling me to go back to the bush in Africa with you to find someone who's going to heal me. Mm -hmm. Are you serious? <laughs> and he said, yes, I absolutely am. And you know what? Um, I did that and I met a lot of amazing people. I had met a lot of them before because in the 70s, I did a series called The Tribal Identity, which looked at all the tribal groups in South Africa, how they differed one to the other and how their cultures and histories uh, compared, uh, differed and their traditions and so on. So I had been exposed to a lot of that during the course of the making of that ethnographic series. I had an anthropologist and we did those series and I met a lot of Sangomas during that. Mm -hmm. um, but Dave was serious about me actually trying to find a cure for my, 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 my kidney disease. And you know what? It was, it was predicted by my, by my nephrologist that I would be on dialysis or be dead by now. And I've had this disease for nearly 30 years and I'm still here to tell the story. Right. And I credit me going back to like that old lady had told me, he must go back to where he came from, which yeah. means go back to your homeland, yeah. which is what I did. And I think I credit that with mainly why I'm still here today. Yeah. Because of those guys. Yeah. And it, it's, it's, it's interesting, really fascinating that, you know, because this woman tells you she predicts your future, which is something we don't understand in the West, right? We, right. we understand yeah. medicine. We have, we have our pharmaceutical companies. We understand I can give you this pill that can do this. And right. some, of, some of these healers use herbs, but it's, it's yeah. more than just the herb. It's the spiritual aspect, right? Because when you did go back to get the healing, you underwent an exorcism, right? I did. Yeah. Uh, um, because this guy, the, the teacher of my friend, uh, a wonderful old man, unfortunately, he's passed away now. I have a great photograph of him in the book. Um, 
uh, he, he was he was an incredible individual. You know, when when we arrived and he lived in this little out, he lived in this little compound place on the outskirts of a town called Menzini in Swaziland. Actually, Swaziland today is now called Eswatini. Uh, the king, who's got like five or six wives, he decided to rename it. Swaziland was its original British term. Okay. And he decided to call it after its original term, mm-hmm. Eswatini. Uh, so, but those days when I went back there, it was still called Swaziland. The language they speak is Swazi, which is closely related to the Nguni languages, which include Zulu. Mm. So Zulu and Swazi is an Nguni language. And so, you know, the, basically those folks understand one another. Mm-hmm. And um, this old man, uh, he, um, he said to me that when I met him, as soon as we met him uh, uh, at his, at, at his um, compound was, uh, let me just get rid of, why have I lost you? Uh, Up here. Are you still there? You're, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the minute he met me, he said, he looked at me and he looked right through me. Hmm. And he said, oh, he said, you're a sick man, aren't you? He spoke perfect English. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, tonight we'll throw the bones. And that night, you know, we, we, t- we stayed at his place. We stayed in one of his guest huts in his little compound. And um, he throws his bones for me. And again, the paradigm is the same. He communicates with his ancestors. The ancestors speak to him. And apparently it's not only his ancestors that, that, that can be accessed, but my ancestors too. Mm-hmm. Because apparently, according to the African paradigm, it's my ancestors or the patient's ancestors that influence the way the bones fall. Mm-hmm. And then it's the, the, the Sangoma's ancestors who allow him to interpret the way they have fallen. So he looks at the bones and he says, oh, yes, he says, you have a very, very serious uh, problem with one of your internal organs. And I think it's your kidneys, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And I said, yes, it is. He knew that immediately. And he said, you know what? I need, you need to see someone a little more powerful than me. You need to see someone that can do a femba mm-hmm. on you. And when he said that, I looked at my friend Dave and I thought, what is it's like indiana jones what does that mean it's like you know um um from from that that movie you know Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i I didn't know what it meant but it sounded terrifying and Mm. dave Dave said no you listen to the guy you listen to exactly what he's saying you do exactly what he says and so he the next day we go into town and he introduces me to this this short little guy was only like five foot five foot ten feet high very meek mild little guy um I'm introduced to him. He spoke no English. And I was told that he was the man who was going to do the Femba. And mm-hmm. he, in other words, he would get rid of the negative energy in my body through this process called Femba. And comes the appointed day, we go to his house, his compound, up in the mountains, overlooking the wilds of Mozambique on the other side of the border. And uh, I go to his, I, I, we welcomed to his compound. He's not, he's not, he's nowhere to be seen. I'm welcomed by two younger guys, apparently his sons, and all dressed in Western, you know, dress. And I get shown into this uh, large hut where all these women are sitting drumming. They're all drumming. Some of them have got babies on their backs and they're all singing and drumming and trilling. Oh, well, you know, I, mm-hmm. it was out of a movie, straight out of a movie with a fire in the middle of the hut. And I'm told to strip down to my underwear. So I throw my, you know, dignity to the wind. I couldn't care where I, you know, this is fine. Hey, why don't sit in the nude in the middle of this hut? Fine by me, whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. and I do that and I'm stripped down just to my, my, my underwear. And I'm sitting in this, in the middle of this hut with a fire going and I'm wondering, so where's this guy? You know, where's this man who's going to perform the Femba? And suddenly in the other end of the hut, a door opens and there he is. This little meek guy that I'd met in town had changed. He'd become a completely different entity. Mm. He was dressed in his tribal regalia, covered in beads, wearing this grass skirt. He had these rattles tied around his ankles made from cocoons. Um, and he goes, yeah. And I I have to tell you, it's straight out of Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. And he dropped onto all fours. He dropped onto his his hands and feet. And on all fours, he'd become an animal. And he walked across the floor towards me, grunting. Mm. 
And the, the way he walked reminded me very much of a, of a hyena. It's as though he had taken on the spirit of a, of a hyena. Mm -hmm. And he came up to me and he started to smell me all the way from my feet, all the way up to my, 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 my torso. And when he got to my kidney area, he starts to get, he wants to retch, he wants to get sick. Mm -hmm. So these two guys ran over to him with a barrel and he vomited this ghastly, slimy stuff into this barrel. It's as though he had extracted from my kidneys some, whatever it was, metaphysically, he'd taken something from me. He'd taken out the illness as though he had ingested it. And he did so on the other side of my body as well. And at the end of this performance, which went on till way after midnight, I felt as though I had been relieved of whatever it was that was causing my illness, I intrinsically and implicitly felt that he had removed that bad energy. Mm, wow. Go figure, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, you know, so we get back to the place where we're staying with, uh, with, with, with the, the, the guy that we, we were with. And he says to me, yeah, um, you are now clear of that. You will be able to survive your illness. And, you know, I have. It's been absolutely amazing. And that was not in, in using any kind of medication, any sort of herbal. It was purely out of some kind of metaphysical, supernatural method that he used. He could tell exactly what was wrong with me and rid my body of my illness with the aid of the ancestors. Yeah. So, um, it, you know, it's it's really interesting to me that you as a as a as a white man raised in, in South Africa in that society, and you and you saw this medicine, but it was it was kind of taboo, I would assume, for white people to take totally. of it. But you were yeah. open to that for some reason. One hundred percent. I mean, I didn't doubt it, for, and I'll tell you why. Mainly because of this television series that I did in the seventies, when I went to all these tribal groups and I met these folks. There was just too much evidence for me when I saw what they did. Mm -hmm. There was just too much evidence that whatever they were doing worked. People were being healed. People mm -hmm. were making a difference. I actually saw a woman who was exorcised of a bad spirit in, in a ceremony um, in, an, in a particular area during the making of that series. That was absolutely phenomenal. It was like straight out of The Exorcist. This, mm -hmm. this, this woman was possessed by something. And I saw this, this, this shaman, the Sangoma, do a ritual with her that she, she came out of that as though she had been relieved of some possessive spirit. It was absolutely incredible. Now, you know, does this, it all sounds kind of like black magic or, or, or ooga booga stuff. It's not, it's real. They have the capability of tapping into another realm that we here in the West have no clue about. Yeah, yeah. Or we deny it. But these folks know about that and they respect that. And so I developed... A respect for that. So when this all began to happen, I was totally open to being exposed to this because I knew that there was more to it than just, you know, than mm -hmm. just hearsay. I knew that it was it, it, it would help me. And, you know, um, I'm proof. The fact that I'm still here is proof of that. Yeah. The fact that you well, the fact that you're still here and the fact that you documented that that first reading you had in 1964 which yes. I would imagine at that point, there was something she told you that seemed to kind of resonate with you. But I, I would imagine going forward as these things started to unfold, you were like, oh, wow, yeah. this, this <laughs> really is happening. <laughs> right. I mean, she foretold, for example, I was nearly killed, uh, uh, trampled by, a maro by, by an elephant in the bush when I mm -hmm. was uh, filming once in, in Mozambique. She foresaw that. She described the event. She did not know that it was an elephant, but she mm -hmm. described the great beast. It will nearly kill you. You must be very careful. And there I was making the safari film in, 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 in Mozambique in 1967. Mm -hmm. And I won't go into the horrible details because basically what it was, I was doing coverage for a group of three white hunters from here from California who yeah. were on safari in Mozambique, yeah. killing wildlife for fun, which made no sense to me. That's why I took the project. And, you know, uh, they shot at an elephant and missed. And there was a, a female elephant who had a baby with her. Mm -hmm. And she knew that her baby was in danger and she charged us. And, you know, I was rooted to the spot. She was actually charging the hunter who had the gun. He ran out of the shot and I was rooted to the spot. I was so terrified. And she kept coming towards me. And I want to tell you, she would have, she would have run right into me and trampled me to death had she not been shot by the white hunter behind me, you know. So again, this was another incident that this woman saw in the bones. 
She didn't say an elephant, but here's an amazing thing, um, um, Brian. I have to tell you this. When I, every time I had my bones read by a Sangoma on all the uh, later occasions, um, every single time they threw the bones for me, the very first thing they would say to me was, what is this, the, what is this Ndlovu that you've got with you? And Ndlovu is the Zulu word for elephant. Mm. They all said, you have this Ndlovu spirit with you. Mm -hmm. What is this? And you know what? When that elephant, when she died in front of me, I filmed her death. And I felt a connection being made between me and that animal when she, when she died. Mm -hmm. It's as though we made this, the, something happened. Mm -hmm. Something happened between us. And I'm not making this stuff up. I'm being absolutely, I think the spirit of that elephant has been around me ever since that happened. And this is way back in 1967. Wow. That wow. she's been around me ever since as a kind of protective spirit. And every time these shamans have read my bones, they have seen the elephant in the bones. They have all said, what's this elephant spirit around yeah. you? You know, yeah. they've seen that, you know. So I, I, I want to ask you, so you, you had this reading in, in 1964. You're, you're a young man and you've seen this unfold over your, over your life. Yeah. Uh, do you believe like... Are, are our lives planned out? Do you think she she saw, or, or was she just was she was she predicting the future? Was I mean, how how do you what's your feeling about that? She was definitely predicting the future. She was seeing into the future without even understanding fully what she was seeing, yeah. because she didn't describe precise things. But you know, the the broad uh, the broad scheme of things all came to came to pass, like the great beast was the elephant the mm -hmm. white world is antarctica you know she didn't know what those but she could see the vision she could see the events yeah. she even she even said one one thing one of the most amazing things she said to david was this guy he, he will meet one day he will meet a man who knew the most evil person who ever lived in the history of the world hmm. and that's when i met adolf hitler's personal pilot which i write about in the book right and it, right. And it was only when that happened that i suddenly realized this guy showed me his photograph albums about, you know, the inner workings of the Third Reich and all and and all of those guys who made the Third Reich work. Mm -hmm. I made a document. The reason was it was a film about aviation. This guy was a a delivery pl uh, pilot back in the thirties for an airplane that flew all the way down Africa to South Africa and eventually became Adolf Hitler's personal pilot. And those two were very very close throughout throughout the war. And he was even with Hitler in the bunker the night that Hitler decided to take his life. So, you know, I met this guy and he shows me his photograph albums. And again, it was like, you know, talk about six degrees of separation. I was one degree of separation, a handshake away from one of the most evil tyrants who ever lived, who was responsible for the death of millions and millions of people. Right. And this old lady had foreseen that. Yeah. How does it happen? So in answer to your question, as as the quantum physicists are now telling us, you know, time is not, is not fixed. There is no yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, and she was a typical example of that. She could foresee events way before they ever happened. So was she able to, 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 to enter this quantum universe, which sciences are now only beginning to understand? And these folks uh, who taught her what she knew and those who came before her had known about all this stuff centuries ago that we're only beginning to unlock now with all our sophisticated technology and our science. They've known about that for centuries. Yeah, that's my theory is that, that mankind at one time, we knew who we were. We, we understood who we were. We understood that we're spirit beings. We understood the ancestors and all that stuff. And then we yeah. forgot West, oh. Western culture, particularly we're like, we got so enamored with ourselves and our technology and our, and our, and our science. And we said, well, we know everything now. Yeah, we don't exactly. need this stuff anymore. So we'll, we'll just call this witchcraft and dark magic and, and we'll write it off. But you know, one, th the thing in your book, it comes back to over and over again. It's, it's, it's undeniable as you read it. And there, there's a story you tell about, well, you were in, I think it was in South Africa, uh, where you guys were filming and someone was disrespectful to, to the people there. And you're, you tell, tell that story. <laughs> tell that story. So I'm making this television series in the 70s about the, the, the tribal groups. Mm -hmm. there, is, there is a tribe in South Africa called the Venda. 
Now, they are distinctly different to all the other tribal groups because they are slightly taller. They obviously must have originally have come from Central Africa and migrated to the south and settled in the northern part of what is now South Africa. Hmm. And they speak a language that is not related to any of the other languages in South Africa, like Sutu, Tswana, Zulu, um, Koza, you know, which was the language of Mandela. And, and so it's a completely separate language. And um, they are a very, very spiritual people. And they have a lot of amazing traditions. And they have a sacred lake in their territory called Lake Fundutsi. And when hmm. I was doing this series, once every five years, the, the members of the tribe, of some of the chiefs and, and headmen, and it's very much a, a patriarchal society, remember. All of these tribal areas are very much a patriarchal society with a chief and a headman, and then you have the general populace underneath it. This is the, this is the African way. This is the tribal way. And it still exists very much today. So what, what they had was uh, once every five years, they would go down to the sacred lake to pay homage to this, the great spirit that created the tribe out of respect. It was like, you know, um, this uh, lake was regarded to be sacred territory and that the spirit lived in there and that their ancestors also hovered around the lake uh, because this, this, this great creative spirit was there as well. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they poured offerings into the lake, usually homemade beer, which is great stuff by the way made from crushed corn that's fermented it's got an oomph to it but boy it's as nutritious as it can as can be uh -huh. you know it's great it's like it's like it's like good irish guinness you know when you drink a bottle of guinness you're drinking a meal you know yeah. there's so much yeah. nutrition mm -hmm. <laughs> and 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 this homemade brew is exactly the same and they offer that to the spirit in the lake so once every five years they do that fortunately we were in the time frame where we could film one of these events mm -hmm. so you know with lots of events and uh, um, uh, arrangements and fixes and whatever else it was arranged that we would get permission to go and photograph the ceremony mm -hmm. and it was all going to be done in tribal regalia they'd all be dressed in their in their traditional uh, uh, um, costumes go down to the lake there would be drumming there would be music and an old old priest a very the oldest the oldest priest um, in the land in in this area mm -hmm. would officiate at the ceremony and you know when we met him we asked him questions through our, through our interpreters and we asked him questions about what he remembered as a child. And clearly this guy was way over a hundred years old. And, and, you know, and they had to uh, help him down to the edge of the lake and he was sort of hobbling there. But anyway, what he did was, you know, he put his hands up and some of the other people would pour the, uh, the, these, these, these offerings, this beer and, and other, other foodstuffs into the lake. And he was putting his hands up like this and he was kind of chanting out to this great spirit over the lake. Now, my anthropologist, who was the host of the series, was in front of me. So here's me, here's my host. And in the background is this priest and the lake and all these other events. Great shot, you know, it's just beautifully composed. But we had to take our shoes off because, you know, it's holy ground. Mm -hmm. You take your shoes off in a place like that. So we had to do that, but there were lots of thorns and pebbles and stuff around. And my anthropologist stubbed his toe and was sort of hopping on his leg like this. And then it's like, ow, 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 ow. And my assistant, uh, one of the assistants on the crew started to giggle. Mm. And it was infection. You know what it's like when, when someone starts to giggle, it spreads like, you know, like wildfire around right, the room. Right. So we're, we're all starting to giggle and laugh. But this, meantime, the ceremony is going on and this old guy is doing his thing you know, doing his, 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 his incantations out to the great spirit in the lake. And we're laughing. We, we, we're giggling behind the camera back there, mm -hmm. which was very disrespectful of us, of course. Yeah. But we couldn't help ourselves. Yeah. You know, I mean, really, we just couldn't help ourselves. And he stopped and he turned around and he looked at us. He's, he's, we was, he's also was like half blind. And he just looked in our direction. The minute he did that, and we're running film, by the way. We, mm -hmm. We're using film and we, we, we're recording our sound on a separate tape, tape deck, you know, with microphones and whatever else. The minute he turned around and looked at us because of our behavior, the camera stopped running, the tape recorder stopped running, every electronic instrument that we had that we were using stopped, just stopped working. Oh, <laughs> you know, I said to Peter, who's my host, I said, Peter, just 
hold on one second. Uh, uh, we got a fix. We got a problem here. And I said to the sound man, Jeff, you, you know, get your voltmeter out. Let's see if we got power here. So we were running around trying to check what's wrong with the circuits of our, of our right. equipment. No, there's power. There's power coming out of the batteries. The voltmeter is working, but nothing is running. None mm -hmm. of the equipment. It's jammed. And I said to my fixer, who was a vendor guy, I said, I don't know what's going on here, but that guy, the priest, is blocking us from filming this, this ceremony. Mm -hmm. He's asking what has happened. And this old priest was just staring at us like this, you know. All the drumming had stopped, everything had stopped. And here we are in panic stations. Nothing's working. Yeah. So our fixer goes up to him and uh, talks to him, whispers into his ear, and he sort of, you know, says something to this to this guy. And the guy comes running back to us and says, "You were not respecting the ancestors, and the ancestors do not want you to film the proceedings. That is why your stuff is your equipment is not working." Hmm. I said, and I said to my host, and I said to the other crew, "Please tell, apologize profusely on our behalf. We didn't mean." to be disrespectful. Please ask him if he could ask the ancestors to allow us to continue. I'll see what I can do, says the fixer. He goes back to the priest, whispers into his ear. The old priest doesn't say a word. He turns around, you know, he's dressed in his, in his beads and his skins and whatever else. And he just holds his hands up like this and he starts to chant out to the lake again. At that moment, everything starts working again. <laughs> The tape recorder starts running, the camera starts working, the curse was lifted, yeah. the blockage was lifted, whatever it was, was gone. There is no question that there are powers and forces that we do not understand. Mm -hmm. And it's beyond our paradigm to understand it, but those guys do. He did. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I really think that it's kind of a thing that we need to, to go back to, to respecting more, because we all came from that. We all, we all, yeah. but we, as so we kind of forgot about it. And and you, I mean, there's so much more, because when we talk about extended consciousness, another thing that people are talking about a lot now is UFOs. And yes. the government, United States government has disclosed a little bit. And I, I think there's some more stuff coming where they're going to talk about, and you've had some experience with UFOs as well. I have, I have. You know, I think that we probably... A lot of people are saying that this is the year of disclosure. You know, I mean, recently when the U.S. Navy released that footage from the USS Nimitz, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that training flight down here near San Diego, I mean, that was extraordinary footage. It was carried by all the networks. Right. But, but, but stuff has been, you know, around for, 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 for years, for decades. Right. I mean, it, it, it predating Roswell. I mean, it goes back much earlier than that. We have, the, the, there is no question that there are, there are there are there there are craft that we do not understand visiting our planet. There's mm -hmm. no question of, of of that, and I don't think for one second that we're alone in the universe. And you know, I've often asked in in tribal areas, what do they think about this, and do they ever see things in the skies? Because mm -hmm. I've I've always been fascinated by this, and I'm going to tell my UFO story in a second. Um, and they say, oh, sure, absolutely, you know, uh, yeah, they come here, we see them. And, and, and uh, um, this guy that I was telling you about earlier, my friend, the surgeon, who took mm -hmm. me back to yeah. Swaziland, he spent some time with the Sun Bushmen, who are the, the last remaining remnants of the Stone Age culture of Africa. They still live in, in, in Botswana in the Kalahari Desert. They are a nomadic group of people who move every day from one place to another. And they have what is known as a trance dance. At night, they light a fire and the men go around the fire and they go into another state of consciousness. They go into another state of awareness altogether. And it's almost like doing remote viewing. Mm. The women drum and they go into a state where they can see where the wildlife or the, the animals will be a week from now or two days from now or three days from now and where they will be because they're hunter gatherers so that they know where to go and do the hunt. Wow. And they can see that. Wow. They travel there in their, in their consciousness, mm -hmm. in their trance dance state. Yeah. These are the sun people of what well, they still do it now, you know? So, and when my friend went there on one, one of his research trips, Above the camp one night is this disc it just appears above the, 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 the group of people. Even in the middle of the Kalahari Desert, it's nothing there except sand dunes. 
of fire and these people going around the, 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 the flames and the women drumming. And the, my friend says, uh, what's that? And the interpreter asks one of the local people, what's that? And the, you know, the guy whispers in his ear and tells him and he says, he comes back and he says, oh, don't worry about them. Those are the people from the other world. They come here all the time. You know, <laughs> you know it's like, don't pay any attention to that. It happens every day, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a given. We're not alone. And those folks know that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, where we, you know, make a big deal out of it. And uh, I think it's because we're hostile, you know, but maybe a UFO would have landed on the White House lawn, on the White House lawn or on the mall, you know, or in mm -hmm. Fifth Avenue yeah. or wherever, if we weren't so hostile, because we are probably the hostile ones, not them. Oh, yeah. Now yeah. I'll tell you a story. I, who knows what these what these what these uh, craft are? And I, I do believe that we uh, have been exposed to alien uh, entities. I, I really do. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that's an, another whole subject matter. But in 1966, I was in Canada, and I was working on a documentary about how urban areas developed in Canada. Now the Canadians live basically all along a string along just north of the US border. That's mm -hmm. where all the major cities are. Right. Everyone knows that. But but here and there you find little settlements up in the northern territory. Canada is huge. And um so we were filming in the province of Saskatchewan and what we need what we were doing was we were filming at a potash plant. Potash is they dig the dig the stuff out of the ground. It's like a white material and mm -hmm. they use it in fertilizer and all that sort of stuff and and in this potash plant uh they 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 it, there's nothing in in that area other than you know wheat fields and corn fields for miles and miles and miles and this potash mine. So we wanted to film a sequence there because around it was developing this little town and that was part of our story, how communities get born, the genesis of urban areas and how they develop. Mm -hmm. So we needed to film at this potash plant. So that night we're staying, it's a small crew, just three of us. We're staying uh, in, at a motel. And the next morning we get up pretty early to go and drive to the potash plant. And we're driving and you could see that like 30, 40 miles away, you could see this white dust coming up from the mm. ground and this cloud sitting in the sky from this potash plant and uh you know eventually we get to 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 to, to the plant we get to the main gate and as we get to the main gate and the, the guy says he, you know he signs us in he says you guys better get down to the parking lot and and take a look at that cloud because there's something up there like you know what do you mean no we don't know what it is but there's something up there in mm. that cloud you know Okay, fine. So we, we, we drive down station wagon days, the days when you, we used to have station wagons. Yeah. And we drive down and we unpack the station wagon. I unpack the camera equipment. The director, I wasn't directing that, the director meets the manager of the mine and they go and talk about the day's filming. But I set up the camera in the parking lot and I put on the longest lens we have, like a telephoto lens. Mm -hmm. And I trained it on this cloud because a couple of the guys from the working at the mine, they came up to me and they said, um, are you trying to shoot you trying to get a picture of that thing that's up there? And I said, yeah, what is it? And he said, and they said, we don't know, but every now and again, you can sort of catch a glint of something sitting in that cloud. Hmm. I'm intrigued. So I, I put on this lens and I look at this cloud and after about 20 minutes or so, a little breeze comes up and the cloud dissipates. And in the cloud is definitely something metallic. Hmm. And I think, wow, you know, um, I was a UFO flying saucer fanatic ever since I, uh, I read George Adamski's book back in the early 50s about flying saucers have landed. You know, that was the first uh, um, evidence that perhaps things were like UFOs, flying saucers existed, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I was always open to that and interested. Besides, I was a, always a sci-fi nut. And so I was waiting for whatever this thing was to reveal itself. And then another little breeze comes up and I tell you, there is this craft sitting up in the, in the sky. Mm -hmm. Now people have often asked me how high, how big, this was before the days of 747 jumbo jets. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a size of one of those. Wow. A, round, a round disc, a, a, a triangle beneath the disc and like a tripod connecting the, the triangle to this disc. Hmm. No windows, no sound, nothing. Just there. Metallic. The sun reflecting off the surface of this thing. Wow. In this cloud. And I run film. I'm running film. I'm getting some film. We, we're shooting 16 millimeter on this particular documentary. And I'm hmm. running film. 
and I must have shot about 150 film, a few feet of film of nothing except this, this craft sitting in the white sky, in this white cloud. Anyway, I eventually turned the camera off because the, 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 the cloud eventually, you know, covered it up again. And uh, the director comes out and said, okay, enough of that. Let's get on with the, with the work we had to do. And we spent the rest of the day working at the plant. You know, at that night, we still had no idea what we'd seen. That night, it was my job to go down to the local rail, railroad depot and hand in the film to be sent all the way to Montreal to go to the lab to be processed to await our arrival, you know, uh, weeks later, which I did. But I, I separated this piece of film in a separate can and I said, hold for our arrival, you know, just for the editor. Just keep this. Don't, don't dump it. Just keep it. And so, you know, a few weeks later, we get back to Montreal and now it's time to look at the, at the dailies of this shoot that we'd been on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we took a long time looking at all the boring footage of housing and, you know, mines and you know, that stuff. And at the end of all of that, the projectionist at the back yells out, he says, do you want me to show this, uh, this short reel here that you've got here that says hold for arrival? Yes, please put it on. So, you know, he puts it on and we've got the head of the camera department there. We've got a couple of other people there. And sure enough, on the screen, as clear as daylight, there is this craft sitting in the sky, silently, doing absolutely nothing except just there. Wow. And the feeling was, we don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. But it was at, during the days of Project Blue Book, and everyone knew about Project Blue Book. You know, um, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was big news. Project Blue Book was run by J. Allen Hynek, out of, I think it was Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And so um, the head of the camera department says, why don't we send that footage down to the States and let them analyze it and see what it is. Maybe it's something that they'd be interested in, who knows, you know? So yeah, sure. So the, 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 the secretary uh, who worked for him, her name was Frankie Johnson. I'll never forget her name. She, you know, wraps up the stuff and couriers it to Ohio and, mm -hmm. uh, and we forget about it. Some weeks go by and one day I go into the camera department and I say to her, Frankie, did we ever hear back from those folks in the, in the States about that, that thing that we, that we shot above Saskatchewan, above that mine? And she said, no, let me call them, uh, you know. Um, and it was, you know, she looked at the time difference. She said, I can call her higher right now. So she calls the uh, Project Blue Book, the office mm -hmm. from the camera department office. And she says, oh, oh, really? Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, you know, and Butcher puts the phone down. And she said, they deny ever receiving the footage, hmm. you know, it was couriered to them. They did receive it. They signed for it and then denied ever receiving it, hmm. which lent to me hmm. and certainly to a whole lot of other folk. The fact that there was, you know, there was a, an attempt to conceal information from the public about these things oh, yeah there, there's no doubt about that at this point i mean the government has admitted it so you know yeah. if you told me this 10 years ago i might say yeah okay but yeah, yeah. now they've, they've yeah. admitted yeah. it we, they, they have so you know so how much more is there to know i think a lot and i think the time is coming pretty close uh, that they may reveal some stuff to us you know uh because yeah there's definitely uh, it's, it, it's for real. It, 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 it's, it, it's, it's been happening for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. uh, Jacques Vallée is a very, very famous French uh, a researcher who's been collecting material about this stuff for years and years. He's just brought out mm -hmm. a, an incredible new book. And it goes right back to the times of, of even ancient Egypt. He's got artwork in this book that shows yeah. that even on the Middle Ages, you know, uh, there, there were tapestries and paintings done in Europe about flying objects in the sky. It's mm -hmm. been around forever. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're running a little bit over, but I do want to ask you one more question. I want to talk to you about you shot a, you shot a documentary about near death experiences. And it's like to get yes. get your take on that for a few minutes. Well, I met a number of people who had NDEs, mm -hmm. uh, and all of them told extraordinary stories. Um, the, the, the the one particular one that I found particularly interesting was a, as a woman by the name of uh, I'll just use her first name Pam. Mm -hmm. This was in Atlanta. She was clinically dead on the operating table. Uh, they had to remove an aneurysm from her brain. And she was, you know, it's, 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 it's very tricky to not uh, have oxygen going to the brain because you, 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 the brain can, can basically shut down. No. So, you, so you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be able to, if, if, if you, if you are 
dead and they have resuscitated people many many times you know by using paddles on the but the the, the try not to 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 let the brain not get oxygen for too long because you could have permanent brain damage this, right. this is always the problem mm -hmm. but they had to put pam they had to stop the blood flowing in her veins and stop her heart because that was the only way to get the aneurysm to get into the brain and get the aneurysm out of there mm -hmm. without her losing a lot of blood so she must have been clinically dead for about 15 minutes and then they sewed it up put this in and revived her resuscitated her and when she was resuscitated after that, she basically described every single thing that happened to her, to her surgeon. Her surgeon didn't believe a word of it. And he said, well, what did, what did you see? She described things that he did. She described the fact, you know, one of her, the assistants uh, 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 during the operation, the surgeon asked for an instrument and the nurse dropped it and she, he scolded her. And Pam said, I saw you do that. Why did you do that? Wow. And he said, you saw that? You were clinically dead at that time. She said, no, I saw you do that. She described the music that he was playing. The, su the su surgery went on for like four or five hours. Mm -hmm. And he had a little tape deck in the corner of the, of the, of the operating room. She said, I liked some of your music, but I didn't like this song and I didn't like that song. <laughs> he said, how could you possibly have heard that? So I interviewed him. I talked to her. There was no question that she was absolutely awake and alive and aware throughout her operations and she was witnessing what was going on i met i met a guy who was basically dead he was crushed by a boulder mm -hmm. and he was brought back to life and he described his entire trip in the ambulance what happened to him in the operating room but you know talking to adults is one thing but what really was amazing for me were the children that I talked to who had near-death experiences. Mm, okay. There was a guy who's a pediatrician in Seattle, and I'll try and make this quick because I know we're, we're running over time now. But I met about four or five kids that were introduced to me by this uh, pediatrician. Mm -hmm. He interviewed kids who had all been clinically dead and been resuscitated, and he asked them to draw pictures of what they saw while they were asleep. Mm -hmm. In other mm -hmm. words, while they were dead. And yeah, dead. yeah. All of those pictures were very similar. And none of these kids knew each other. Mm -hmm. This tunnel of light, these white beings, these angels, these big blobs of light that floated around, the fact that they were given an option to return back to mommy and daddy or to go to another place, you know, follow the angels or whatever, how, what, what, whatever these white figures were that they right. were talking about. When kids tell you things like that, they're not lying. They're not making it up, especially when they don't know each other. And yeah. it's all so similar. Yeah, absolutely. So there is no death. It's just the demise of the physical body. And for folks who really want to find out some really good scientific stuff about it, read about Dr. Robert John and the Princeton Anomalies Research Unit at Princeton University. Mm, the guy okay. is now passed on. He was in my show. I did a show for one of the networks called Beyond Death, a two-hour show. Okay. And, and, and the brief was, what happens to the, to the consciousness or the spirit or the soul mm -hmm. when the body dies? And that's what this two-hour special was about. I met the most... Un there is no death. It's just the demise of a physical being. We go on. Yeah. There is no end. Wow. There's no question of that. Yeah. Well, that is that is a great note to end on. Um, I want to thank you for for doing this. This has been a fascinating uh, time spent with you. Any last thoughts you want to say before we wrap up? You know, I think uh, I think probably um, what I'd like to, you know, if I have anything to say and if I've learned anything and particularly now you and I are doing this a day after Martin Luther King Day uh, mm -hmm. when we are, we're doing this interview today. Um, you know, and, 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 to, and tomorrow is Inauguration Day. And so we're living in kind of troubling times. And a lot of people are scared. And we've got a pandemic around us. The world is dark and scary right now. Yes. But, you know, I just want folks to think. And because my experience has been, you know, there's always light at the end of every tunnel. And we always have to remain a, a, maintain a positive attitude. And I think one of the most critical and important things to do is to not to listen to hearsay, but to be curious within yourself and to try and find out. If you're curious about anything, find out as much as you can without believing everything that you're told. Because I have found that insatiable curiosity keeps you alive and keeps you young and keeps you going. The more we know, the more we know what we don't know and how much more incredible is the universe as we live in this incredible place, you know. 
Wow. It's an extraordinary it's an extraordinary journey. We're all on the same journey. And I think we're all connected. I think there's a grid that binds every one of us. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you again for being here. I want to tell people how they can get the book. It's coming out very shortly. We're recording this on January 19th, uh, 2021. It's called Forever in My Veins, How Film Led Me to the Mysterious World of the African Shamans. It's by Lionel Friedberg. Uh, you can find out more about the book at johnhuntpublishing.com. And I'll, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Uh, or, on, you, or on Amazon. It's available right now. Oh, it's available on Amazon right now. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to encourage people to, to get the book. If you like the movies, if you like adventure, um, and it's 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 a whole adventure of your life mixed in with all this great stuff about, you know, the extended consciousness realm that we're all interested in. So uh, thanks again for being here. Oh, thank you, Brian. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks for having me on. And thanks, everyone, for watching. I appreciate it so much. Thanks. Have a good day. Thank you. That's it for another episode of Grief to Growth. I sure hope you got something out of it. Please stay in contact with me by reaching out at www.grieftogrowth.com. That's grief, the number two, growth.com. Or you can text the word growth to 31996. That's simply text growth, G-R-O-W-T-H, to 31996. Since you're watching this on YouTube, please make sure you're subscribed. So hit the subscribe button and then hit the little bell here and it'll notify you when I have new content. Always please share the information if you enjoy it. That helps me to get more views and to get the message out to more people. Thanks a lot and have a wonderful day.